Hi, you're watching a very special session of Agenda Wani recorded outside. This is not my usual studio setting. You know why, right? Because if you've been following Agenda Wani, when I go out, that means I'm off to great speakers and interviewees. And I'm very, very glad that I finally, after several years, get to sit down again with somebody that I could have been if I take the same decision like him to leave the media. He is now a futurist, award-winning author, very much sought after international speaker, Mike Wash. Thank you so much for making time. It's good to see you again. Yeah. You, get, you get to see me slowly age. No, when I see you, <laughs> I, this is what I'm, I was supposed to be if I had the courage to live. To grow your hair. Yeah, you, know, you <laughs> left News Corp, and, you know, but, uh, but thank God for that. Because books like this, this is his latest. The last time we interviewed, he had another book that was latest. This algorithmic leader. We'll come to this. Okay. Uh, he was telling me the gist of it about 10 traits that leaders now should have in this fourth uh, industrial revolution era. But um, before we go into all that, Mike, I just want to catch up on things. And, you know, several years ago, we were already talking about the things that people are busily talking about today. And I was just saying to you before we start this interview about culture. People always look at technology and try to get the best technology and then do their own, register their pattern and innovate. But then later they realize, hey, it's not something you can buy off the shelf, implement and replicate. There's this human side called culture, called emotional caution and everything else. Fast forward several years from our last conversation and now with this new book, and you're here today, and thanks to HRDF, it's their conference and exhibition 2019 that I'm taking the liberty to steal Mike away from. <laughs> um, where are we now, Mike? Because as a futurist, you have looked at what's happening now years before. But now that we are here, it's just a few more days to 2020. And you know, we spoke about this. Malaysia had a vision to be a developed nation by 2020. Ain't going to cut it. But we are really looking at how we adapt to technology. Where do you think the world is? And since you are in Malaysia, I'm sure you've done your homework on Malaysia too. Where do you think Malaysia is? You know, when we, we last spoke, the, the focus was really around digital. And it was just the early days of people embracing new technology, data, and the web as a, and mobile as a channel. And I think really people believed then you could just buy your way into the future. If you had the latest enterprise software and the, you know, the right relationships with uh, Google or Amazon, that would be enough to succeed. Culture was a nice to have. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of thing you do yeah. as a luxury. Maybe you, you know, uh, provide <coughs> free food for your employees or you know, mm -hmm. video games or uh, casual Fridays. But now I think it's become clear that the real definer of success in, the, in this age is not something you can buy. Yeah. Culture is more than just a luxury. It is a, it's an operating system. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a system of how people make decisions, about how they collaborate, how they solve problems. Not only is it not something you can buy, it's not even something you can steal or borrow. Okay. You've got to find within the DNA of how you work and why you work. Mm -hmm. And weirdly enough, that's become more important, not less, okay. given that we're in a time of AI. Yes. When I look at things, Yes, digital is now the buzzword, but people also worry about the coming of IoT, of big data analytic engines, of robotics and automation, you know, and mobility of 5G is going to enable all these biological, technological, mechanical automatons that people think, hey, we're going to lose about a few hundred million jobs around the world. Yeah. What are these people going to do? And then these people will say, you know, you've got to unlearn, relearn and learn new stuff. But people are forgetting that human emotional quotient. If you take away the job that I like, I might not want to upgrade so-called to that new job that you think I should have. I, I might want to see how the whole plain playing field has changed and I want to be empowered. Just like when you left salaried work, for example. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. There's, there's a, a huge and growing fear around technology. And probably one of the biggest fears is going to be the impact of technology on our work. Mm -hmm. uh, people are worried, are robots going to take away their jobs? Mm -hmm. 
But interestingly, the, people are so worried about that question, they don't ask themselves a more important question, which is how is technology, and particularly AI, yeah. going to change our jobs? And not just the kind of jobs of factory workers mm. or people in warehouses, how is it going to change white color jobs? Yeah. Because I know you, you believe this as well, that <laughs> probably the people most at risk are not the junior level positions. Correct. It's the managers, yeah. it's the leaders. Because so much of what they do, which is orchestrating and coordinating mm -hmm. and making decisions, is exactly what machines are much better at than us. Correct. You know, arguably stacking warehouses is cheaper to use people yeah. than expensive robots. Yeah. So it is, leaders of today cannot be complacent. Mm -hmm. And we have an important choice because there are two paths open to us. There's one path where we use technology and data to actually create more meaningless, quantitized work where we're measuring every, you know, every milliscule of the work, like kind mm -hmm. of 21st century tailorism. Yes. And you're seeing this in some warehouses mm -hmm. today. There's another future, which is much better, where we use AI to take away the repetitive, non-meaningful work. Yeah. And we create opportunities for people to develop and do things that are more interesting. Mm -hmm. A lot of these changes are now happening in the borders of nation states. Mm. The first leadership call into question are the political leadership. And we've seen the rise of partisan politics in the more developed nation, in the West, in America, in Europe. Don't let me even start on Brexit and stuff. But uh, taking the gist out of it, why are the leaders struggling at the national level in facing the disruptions of the fourth industrial revolution because they should be milking new technologies, seeing new opportunities and raising more wealth creation. But instead, what is happening, more and more national leaders, and these are from well-learned countries with higher uh, level of technological prowess and education, saying that, I don't know, we're going to build borders and walls and you know, we're going to look at our own people first. I mean, since when is technological achievement only done by a select group of people? It's the travelling around the world and the mixture of ideas that have given us the level of technology yeah. that we have. Well, you know, leaders face a unique conundrum today. And it's a paradox because on one side, um, social media has been weaponized, mm -hmm. okay. uh, you know, to really reduce complex ideas into very simple slogan uh, kind of tweetable concepts, okay. which is, is why you see the rise of nativism and tribalism mm -hmm. and nationalism. It's because these things, in a sense, get amplified by the filter bubbles of, of, of social media. Okay. But on the other side, the problems of the world have become more complex and they're, they're more difficult. And as you say, they're global in nature. Like climate change, it's not something you can solve it by one country. Yes. It takes a coordinated, mm -hmm. sophisticated, science-led approach. So this schism is pulling politics and governments apart. At the very time we need more complex uh, consideration of issues, we don't have the time because of the shift in populism. Yes. So I want to angle in into your book now, The Algorithmic Leader. So would politicians be the first group of people that should not only be reading this book, but getting your phone number so that <laughs> you can talk sense into their approach to their problems right now? Because if they don't get it right, I mean, climate change is something that we can manage. But our refusal as a global population to really do what's needed to be done today do we really need a 16-year-old Scandinavian schoolgirl <laughs> to go all the way on a yacht, cross the Atlantic Ocean, to school the leaders of the powerful nations on Earth in New York? Look, I, 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 the thing is, the, the big global issues are important, but they sometimes can seem so big, we feel we have no power to do anything about them. And, and that's why I wrote this book, because I wanted to write something positive that could inspire people and give them hope. Mm -hmm. There's so many books today around the dangers of technology, around the surveillance state, around why we have to be frightened of Facebook and Google, why AI is gonna take over and destroy our yes. jobs. But in many ways, technology can also give us a path. Okay. Science, not fear, 
or guilt is going to solve the climate problem. Mm -hmm. uh, technology can create more meaningful, less repetitive work. Artificial intelligence can help us discover cures for new diseases, uh, can you know, help us manage the weather and the climate better. But we need to change our mindset around it. Mm -hmm. And that's going to require a new generation of leaders. Okay. So what I did for this book is that I've spent uh, a number of years uh, traveling the world, meeting people like yourselves, uh, researching a new generation of leaders that are using technology for, for the benefit. Okay. And tried to understand what was driving them and what were the kinds of emerging rules okay. and principles around how they did what they did. There's a lot of, you know, I even call my friends cheapskates because they refuse to read books. If they know I'm doing this conversation about this book, they just want, you know, the, the social media generation, they just want, give me the top three, give me the top five. Oh, they don't need to read the book, they can yeah. just read the back. <laughs> right. You know. so, so let's do one better. Let's hear it from you. Maybe we select three key things from the book of the traits of the algorithmic leader that you think, and you've been around Malaysia, you've been around Southeast Asia, you've been around the East, maybe more than I do. So maybe what's the three traits that could work best with the kind, you know, we love our food, we quarrel even about which food originated from which country, but we're friends. So, you know, the passion of Asia and, and the new kind of leaders, because uh, it's good to talk about transformation, but I want to hit reset with Mike here. Let's just say that we have the luxury of resetting things tomorrow and we can plonk in a new type of leader. What is that new type of leader going to be? We go for the first break, but once we are back, if you're too lazy to read the book, but you must buy it, you must support Mike because the richer Mike gets, the more he will help us. Okay, then why don't we talk about it after the short break. Imagine having the luxury of living a brand like News Corp and traveling all over the world, being the nomad, digital at that also, and that's the guy sitting in front of me looking like a rock star, but actually <laughs> rocking the future for us. He's a futurist. Um, that's his book. You can get it uh, here in KL. But um, Mike, you know, some of us are so busy, so I'm going to do that cheat stuff that the new generation like to do. So you're going to have to maybe take out three key things from this book to lay on top of your latest experience in traveling across Malaysia and this region change you know for me becoming an algorithmic leader is not like becoming a programmer I, I call them algorithmic leaders because these are leaders who've evolved and adapted to meet the new demands okay. of the algorithmic age mm -hmm. and for me that comes down to two critical very different qualities on one side you have to develop a deep understanding for human complexity Okay. So this is the ability to understand how to empathize, how to motivate, how to know what a good customer experience is. Uh, you know, in essence, these are things machines will never be able to do yeah. because you have to be human to really understand mm -hmm. this. But it's not enough. So sometimes people say that the key to survive in the future is just all the soft skills. Yeah. But, but it isn't sufficient. Mm -hmm. We also ne need to take some qualities of machines as well. Okay. So the second quality I would say is we need to develop a, a flair for computational thinking. Okay. And this is the ability to make decisions and solve problems in a structured enough way that you can leverage data, mm -hmm. technology, and artificial intelligence to augment your capabilities. How different is that from wisdom? Well, it, it really, wisdom is that middle path, okay. right? So you've got to update the concept of wisdom in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. and, and real wisdom in this new age means sometimes the best decision you can make is knowing you don't make the decision at all. In fact, you should rather than make a decision, you should train a system to make the decision for you. And that really, okay. that requires you to let go of your ego. Correct. Because we, we are coached to think that being a successful leader means making all the big decisions. Yes. But in this new world, sometimes it's knowing that you're better off not doing the work. Letting you're go. Letting go and actually designing a system mm. to do the, the work that you thought was your job. My, you know, I love you, but I have to be a devil's advocate here. Look at Brexit. Look at how Trump, despite the odds, winning that election when, you know, Hillary's team probably outspent him by three times on media, on 
AI driven semantic analysis of social media and whatever not. So it's not just the data, but you know, sifting through it, linking it to make sense that works and having that right intuition on the matter. I mean, you know, I mean, but, if I go but, to But actually, example, this is my point, is that you need those two skills. You need a deep understanding of human behavior, but you also need to know the technology and the data. Okay. And the, the great leaders of the future are the ones who can walk that two paths. Now, if you want an explanation of Brexit and, uh, <laughs> and Trump's America, you know, you, you don't even need a futurist. I think you need to go see a psychologist. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a whole other set of, of 21st right, century fine. problems. But, but I, I think we need, a new, we need a new archetype for what is a good leader in the future. I okay. mean, if you think about it, it's the difference between Steve Ballmer and Satya Nadella. Okay, right. okay. Steve Ballmer was the football coach, yeah. stood on stage, mm -hmm. yelled at people, told mm -hmm. them to sell more product. Mm -hmm. Satya Nadella is the connector, the networker. You know, he, he asks, rather than asking people to work for Microsoft, how can Microsoft work for them? Is that partly Asian thing also? Um, I'd like to think so, being half Asian. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but I think it's, it's about, you know, the new model of leadership. Okay. You know, my, this is called, if not already, the Asian age, because the focus of power is now balancing to the East. Yeah. And we have always had this great debate of, you know, there's more values in Asia, there's more cultural perspective in Asia. And many people only look, especially from the West, at China and see only the ideology of communism and everything else. But for the Asian people, when they look at China, like many Malaysians look at China as family. That's where my family came from. Yeah. So they don't mine, look at mine, ideology. Mine as well. Correct. So, how do you think we can encapsulate that into what you're saying in this book? Because we want our cake and we want to eat it, eat it too. We want the environment that we grew up with. We, I love the village that I was born into. I love the environment. I love the closeness, the close-knit community relationships. But I want all the modernity of technology too. Do you think that's one of the forefront of things that must be looked at for any leader in the Asian-driven Age. It's, it, it's very hard to predict the collision of Asian values with the AI era. Mm -hmm. um, I think in many ways it'll be a, a benefit because the concepts of family and support which are intrinsic in this culture. I mean, I know from my own, my own childhood, my mother's dream was to, you know, have the entire family live in one house because, right. you know, in the Asian values, yes. the eldest is the one who's still in charge. Yes. Right? And you eat dinner together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so I think these support networks will actually help in the transition, okay. you know, with the, with the changes in the job workforce. In the West, it's going to be much more difficult because they lack those support structures. But in the general question of the impact of Asia is even more interesting because the most interesting things in the world right now happening in AI are happening in Asia. Okay. I mean, you look at China. Yes. They are, have already become an algorithmic society. Okay. I mean, people don't even use money there. They don't yeah. even use credit cards. Yeah. You know, everything is on Weixin or you know, these new mobile applications. Yeah. And if you look at even now what's coming still out of Korea and Japan and Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. incredible dynamism. Yes. That's why I want to go to you because, you know, Malaysia's central bank has just given the first license to a digital asset currency company, mm. uh, Luno. But um, before everybody jump on the bandwagon of wanting bitcoins and everything else, I just want to ask you this because China is a great, great story, you know. Diminishing hardcore poverty from 88% to a single digit now, everything across maybe one or just two generations. But the best things that they have done are very much in their own ecosystem. Mm. What happens when they bring it outside their borders? Yes, there's the Belt Road Initiative and everything else, but South Korea has been more successful in, you know, like if you look at this group called BTS, they beat any Hollywood groups in terms of following, in terms of the emotional engagement, and majority of their fans don't even understand the lyrics of their songs, for example. <laughs> and that's powerful. Imagine if China has that. You know, right now it's more technological, economic might, but this softer side of skills and power that people like to see. So it, how do you see that? It, 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 it's an open question about cultural impact. Because if you look at it, before China was Japan, 
and a lot of the the technologies we use today were incubated in Japan. I mean, Steve Jobs went to Japan and studied iMode okay. and the phones there, and he was inspired to create the iPhone based mm -hmm. on what he saw in Japan. And this is a story that people yeah. don't, don't don't often follow. But the thing is, the Japanese found it very difficult culturally translating their platforms and apps to other markets. Mm -hmm. Now, the same thing's going to happen in China. What's going on in China today is already inspiring other applications and services in the yeah. West whether or not they will actually be able to take those and make them work in the US. We've seen some early examples, TikTok, yes. you know, it's a Chinese company, okay. right? And it's, you know, it's taken the world by storm. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be interesting to see, you know, whether the next great platforms are not gonna come from America, they'll come from China. Look at 5G and the problems of With Huawei. Huawei. Mm -hmm. So what's your, how do you read that? With hope, because if we're, to chart out a doomsday thing, it's easy just from that. But take out the silver linings and look at hope from there. Look, I, 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 I truly believe that it's in no country's interest to sabotage the global system mm -hmm. in the long run. Yep. And I, th I, I think the Chinese, more than any other culture, uh, b believe in global cooperation for growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah. rather than, uh, than military aggression. And I think this has been a consistent pattern. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, you know, in the digital world where cyber attacks yeah. become much more difficult to Correct. actually pin the exact yes. culprit, it becomes a much more sensitive issue. Mm -hmm. um, so I think countries are, are well within their rights to demand more transparency and accountability. Mm -hmm. But I, I am optimistic okay. in that I think ultimately we will pass through this period of nationalism and tribalism yes. and we'll realize that it's only a okay. coordinated global effort. Let's assume that we will surpass that. I mean. Many people can't wait to see the rollout of 5G because we're waiting for, you know, it's like a highway that you finally be able to test the maximum speed of your car. So 5G will enable that kind of mobility for medical care, for education. Um, and, you know, there are parts of uh, geography in Malaysia, like in the Borneo side, Sarawak, where the school don't even have a cement floor. It's just ground. But through satellite and through the ground, uh, on ground base stations, we could deliver education straight there. It doesn't matter whether they're sitting under trees. It's the quality of content of education. This is the power of 5G. So do you think the rollout of 5G with the advent of things like IoT and AI at the base behind this network could really see shared prosperity and inequality being bridged? It depends on our imagination. And I say that because a lot of the arguments that people make about 5G, I've heard before with 4G and even 3G. Right. And, and that's because people really struggle to imagine how things might be different beyond faster email on their phone or watching videos with a higher bit rate. So th the question is, what is gonna be possible in a world of 5G plus data plus mm. AI mm. that we couldn't do before? And if we can come up with an interesting answers to that, it will lead to a transformative change in our society. I cannot leave you without asking this question selfishly about Malaysia. I mean, you've come here a few times during the past year. Um, I remember going to a very technical forum and China had, I think, something called TDS, CDMA oh, in yeah. the 90s. And that it was the jumping base for Huawei to be where it is now that dedication, discipline for, for homegrown technology. Now, Malaysia is asking this question, you know, we're fighting about flying cars or whatever not, but where would Malaysia be able to park its strategy as far as the coming technology is concerned? Because Malaysia refused to just be a user of technology, we also want to contribute yeah. to making new technologies. I think Malaysia is in a really unique spot, um, not only geographically in the region, but it has uh, an increasingly educated, very mobile savvy, um, multilingual population mm. and that also has the cultural adva advantages of having you know, multiple religions and cultures, mm -hmm. which makes it a gateway, not just east-west, but to the Middle East as well. Okay. So, so I think you know, Malaysia can be a key gateway you know, that can link multiple cultures and technologies. Mm. So take the intangibles and form it into something that technology-wise, uh, 
can and, be and it goes back to culture, you yeah. know, as we said. Yeah. You know, it's not just you. about the technology. Yeah. There's a very strong cultural and political and social dimension to these new technologies. Correct. And you, you cannot underestimate the power of these ideas which have been around for thousands of years. Yeah. You know, long after these technologies are gone, we'll still have these ideas and values. Yeah. So whether it's Islamic finance mm -hmm. or it's new models of social cooperation mm -hmm. or politics, mm -hmm. Malaysia can be an incubator yes. you know, for the merger and cohesion of these ideas in new and interesting ways. There you go. If you guys are looking at somebody just to you know, transform your organization, Mike Walsh is here. He's very much sought after around the world. But I thank God and you for always stopping by Malaysia in your journey around the world. Thank you so much, Mike Walsh, for making time again. again. Thank you. I hope the next interview will wait several years. Maybe it should be next year. 2020 <laughs> is a very important number for Malaysia. Thank you so much to you. Always giving us hope as far as technology and future is concerned. That's why I call him the Bono of Futurists. Because he looks like Bono, but... <laughs> He doesn't look like it, but he has a lot of Asian DNA in him also. And uh, we've got to make sense of this complexity and for us to make that decision, that tough decision sometimes, like climate change, inequality. We can tackle all this, but we need to come together and we need to do the right thing. Mike has painted some picture. We'll continue to be discussing this on Agenda Wani. Thanks to HRDF allowing me to steal Mike for a bit so that we can share all this with the new Malaysia hope that we have in our country right now. Good night and goodbye.